Closed captioning for Education Matters is sponsored by Margaret's Garden Adult Daycare and Will Lou Gray Opportunity School out of West Columbia. Would I be allowed to appear on this station if it were not for the contributions of this man, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today inside of Education Matters, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Why his life mattered then and now. Education Matters is next. <laughs> Hello and welcome inside a brand new segment of Education Matters. My name is Donna Moore Westby, your host of Education Matters, where learning is living. It's going to be a very fascinating broadcast. We will talk about a subject that definitely conjures up a lot of mixed feelings, but hopefully by the end of this broadcast, we will have a way to move forward, move forward together in love and in unity. My guests here today are ready to share some of their personal testimonies. So I pray you're with us the entire broadcast today. Of course, we thank the sponsors of Education Matters, our corporate sponsors, make it possible for us to be here every week. Of course, WRDW Channel 12, Howell Printing out of Aiken, South Carolina, your full service printer offering graphic design services as well. We hope you give them a try. Security Federal Bank, there is a Security Federal throughout our entire broadcast coverage area. Thanks for your support as well. Westby's Products and Services, creator of Don Seasoning Delight, all-purpose seasoning and marinade. Also, Margaret's Garden Adult Daycare, opening very soon in the Central Savannah River area. Very beautiful facility in Aiken, South Carolina, and we'll be announcing their grand opening, hopefully, on next week's broadcast. Also, the University of South Carolina in Aiken, always doing great things for our students here in the area and across the world, many students. And uh, USC Aiken was um, the home of our health and fitness, health and wellness contributor inside of Education Matters, Dr. Brian Parr. You saw him on last week. And then finally, Access Chiropractic, where the chiropractor is Dr. Blair Bradley. Here he is for you on the screen. Special thanks and acknowledgement to all of our corporate sponsors. If you're interested in becoming a part of our sponsorship family, please give us a call on 803-507-6793, or you can write me and I'll give you that email address in just a moment. Also, not to forget our personal sponsors, Bill and Joy Bradley out of Aiken, Miss Sharon White of Aiken, and Isaac and Betty Rucker, and Deacon Henry and Nancy Craig, all of Aiken. Thanks so much for your support. Okay, moving on to this week's chalkboard reminder. And I'm sure you know this, it goes along with today's broadcast quite well. Monday, January the 19th is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That is when we observe the holiday. Most school districts, banks, and post offices will be closed that day in observance of the national holiday, okay? So wanted to remind you about that. If you need to go to the bank or need to mail some packages, you definitely want to try to get that done before Monday. That is your chalkboard reminder for this week. Okay, I got my bell covered up. <laughs> that sound means it's Word of the Week time inside of Education Matters. Every week we do provide you with a brand new Word of the Week. Of course, as adults, we need to keep learning and growing. And then for our students, it is to help you get ready for those standardized exams, such as the ACT and the SAT, and it kind of helps you get ready as well, uh, you know, as you continue to get older and learning and growing. So here is this week's word of the week. Exhum, exhum, mm -hmm. you've heard it before, E-X-H-U-M-E, -E. and it is a verb, and it means to remove from a grave, or it also means to uncover 
a secret, all right? And that's the meaning I'll use for this week's sentence, and here it goes. Intelligence agents were able to exhume information from the informants, okay? Intelligence agents were able to exhume information from the informants. They were able to uncover secrets, all right? Exhume is your word of the week this week, as I say every week, for a continuous list of our words of the week. Just go to the website, edmat.com. There it is for you. Also check out the website throughout the week. We have many articles also web pages that may be of interest and of help to you and you can also connect to our feature video of the week which is a previous segment of education matters all right very good that's your word of the week now quickly moving on to this week's grammar lesson of the week all right here we go when to capitalize nouns mm -hmm. now here's your tip do not capitalize common nouns, okay? What is a noun? It's a person, place, or thing, and sometimes an idea. In general, those are called common nouns. Now, when you get to talking about a noun that is very specific, then it is called a proper noun, and that's when you will capitalize in a sentence. Let's look at some examples. She plans to take a trip to Asia and Africa very soon. What are our proper nouns? Our very specific places in that sentence, Asia and Africa, and you can see they're capitalized. Then moving on, she plans to visit several continents before she starts working. See the difference there? Continents is not capitalized because it is a common noun. It's general, it's not specific. Here's another example. Jonathan lives off Washington Road. Why is the W and the R capitalized? Because it's a very specific place, all right? That's the difference. So make sure you put that in practice. I think you're able to give me some more. Very good, uh, Lauren. Jonathan's best friend lives on the road next to mine. The only capital letter there is Jonathan. It is, of course, at the beginning of the sentence, but you see road is not capitalized there. It is a common noun. It's not specific. Your final example, the Mississippi River is named from a word meaning great river. The only capitalization there, Mississippi, the M in Mississippi, and then river, all right? That is your grammar lesson for this week. All right, quickly moving on, we've got a community announcement for you in line with today's topic. There will be a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. community celebration where the speaker will be Charles F. Bolden Jr., who is the administrator of NASA. He's a former astronaut and South Carolinian. Now, this community celebration will take place on Sunday, January the 25th, beginning at 2.30 p.m. at USC Aikens Convocation Center. It's a great time to come bring your youth groups out, bring your families out so we can celebrate the contributions of Dr. King all under one roof. There'll be some singing and uh, lots of exciting things going on. A lot of sponsors have come together to plan this event. And uh, so we look forward to seeing you there. Again, that's Sunday, January the 25th, 2.30 p.m. at the Convocation Center. Okay, well, we've got lots to cover today. I want you to sit back and relax. Go ahead and start praying with us right now. Our topic today, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., why his life mattered then and why it matters now. You're inside of Education Matters. We'll be right back. The Will Blue Gray Opportunity School has been serving the beautiful Midlands of South Carolina since 1921. Our mission has evolved over the years and we now specialize in helping young people move past their obstacles in order to achieve success. We give students opportunities to lead, to develop social skills, to become active in their communities and to taste success. Don't settle for less than the absolute best for your life. Contact us today to take the next step in your journey toward success. I lead a busy life. 
but I still have to make sure my family eats right. And everybody loves Don's Seasoning Delight. I use Don's on meats and vegetables. It's healthy, tastes great, and it's simple to use. It's like having a chef in a bottle. My seasoning is available at Kroger, Bilo, Food Line, Roots, and Harvest. Look for it on display in the meat department. Also visit SeasoningDelight.com for information and recipes. Don's Seasoning Delight. It's so good. Have you made the switch? Make the switch to the original one of a kind. WNRR Gospel 1380 AM. Your new favorite station for the latest in chart topping gospel music, news, and entertainment. So why don't you make the switch today to WNRR Gospel 1380 AM? Also, listen live, 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 live on WNRR Gospel.com. Or download our free iPhone or Android app and search at WNRR Gospel. WNRR Gospel 1380 AM. Your new favorite station. Welcome back inside of the broadcast. If you're just tuning in, you're watching Education Matters with me, Donna Moore Westby. We're inside of Education Matters, learning is living. Today, inside of the broadcast, we are preparing ourselves to honor a man who is certainly no stranger to our country. He has made so many contributions to making it possible, I believe, for me to be in your home right now. And we're going to talk about that and so much more today as we pose the question, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., what were his contributions back then, many, many years ago? Why did his life matter then and why does it matter today? It's pictures like these that you will see on the screen right now that conjure up so many feelings of the past not so distant past. Maybe there are feelings of hatred. Maybe there are feelings of confusion. Maybe there are feelings of bewilderment. Maybe you found yourself asking the question, why? Why was life so difficult then? Why was there injustice, disenfranchisement, the hatred? Today, inside of Education Matters, we'll explore those questions and so many more because it is my personal belief that in order for us to move forward, move forward socially, politically, economically, sometimes that means confronting the perils of the past. It is very difficult to move forward when you don't understand the past. Our history is something we cannot necessarily run, run away from, but what will we do with history? How will our history be, history be written? Today inside of Education Matters, we have two individuals who had a connection with Dr. King, and they're in the studio with me today. We have uh, many questions we'll ask. Why his life mattered? Why him? What can we do about it today? These individuals will share personal testimonies, some that may conjure up some good feelings and maybe some not so good. But I have already petitioned the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the words to say, to make the connection that we need to make to help us move forward, even if it's nothing but right here in the central Savannah River area. I believe we can do it. Are you on board? Joining me now inside of Education Matters are two individuals I have truly come to respect and admire, and you'll see why in just a moment. Uh, to my right, you may recognize her. She was on Education Matters so about a two <laughs> months or so ago. And her name is Miss Irene Curtis, a former educator, retired educator. I shouldn't say former because you're still educating <laughs> everywhere you go. Uh, also grew up uh, with Dr. King and will share with us some of her stories. And beside Miss Curtis is local historian, Mr. Wayne O'Brien. He has also become a regular inside of Education Matters, our radio broadcast, as well as our television broadcast, and always has such a wealth of knowledge and information 
and also personal testimonies. Although he's quite young, I say that because we're <laughs> similar in age. So <laughs> I'm open, I'm still young. But anyway, but you have also such uh, marvelous stories to share with us as well. So welcome to both of you Thank to you. the broadcast. Thank you. And we're, we're delighted to have you here. Um, Wayne, Mr. Bryant, I'm going to actually start with you. When we look at uh, photos depicting the, the days and times of the, the 1960s, when it seemed as if we were at war, and not even at war with a foreign nation, but at war right here on our own home front, uh, whites only, and um, you know, blacks, Negroes, or of course uh, the N word, mm -hmm. you know, having to go to the back, uh, in, or, or being called the N word, I should say, individuals having to um, enter. Uh, buildings from the back, all of these kinds of things that happened during uh, the Jim Crow uh, laws and um, and all of all of those times that I can't even imagine because I wasn't born back then. Um, I want to first of all ask this question: Is the dialogue about Dr. King and what happened during the past is it relevant today? Oh, certainly. Uh the present in the modern world that we live in is kind of on the foundation of the civil rights movement because uh, that marks a, a, a turn in history. Mm -hmm. There was a period, as you mentioned, with the uh, Jim Crow separate and, and, and unequal. There was a period prior to King and then there's a period after King. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the era that we live in now, we actually are living on that period that was built uh, during King's era and after. I was born in 1969, and you were born just a few years 60. prior to me. In 60? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were uh, around during those days and right. times when uh, there was such separation and, and segregation. Uh, tell us how, what your interaction was, what your involvement was uh, during the Civil Rights Movement and your connection with Dr. King. Okay, as, as I mentioned, I was born in 60. And so I was born right in the middle of the civil rights movement. And I grew up in Charleston. And it's you know, a pretty dynamic place. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King would come visit um, frequently. My parents were involved, my grandparents. And so uh, when he would come to speak, as a matter of fact, my church was the uh, headquarters for the SCLC. Okay. Uh, Marsh Brown AME and Congressman James Clyburn was a member. He had just recently gotten out of college and he was wow. very politically active. <laughs> so I've known him all, he's known me all my life. And so uh, because the, the area was so uh, active, proactive, uh, we, we just had an opportunity to be involved in a lot of uh, the activities that, so whenever uh, Dr. King would come to town, my uh, parents, grandparents would take us to go and see him. Mm -hmm. And so my entire life, uh, that's really all I knew. I was born in the middle of a movement with people who were active in it. Hmm. Uh, I had a very interesting upbringing because the block that I grew up on was half white and half black. Wow. You know, from our house to one corner was all black and from the neighbor's house to the next corner was all white. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of dividing place and my grandparents across the street was the same way. And uh, so during the 60s, with some of the tensions and some of the things going on, my white friends, who were like brothers to me, mm. uh, we were able to continue the friendship even though the world was going in these, these polar directions. Um, directions. Yes. So when, that, when we left the block, things were a little different. Mm. When we came on the block, we were able to hold those friendships together. But what we did on that block was what Martin Luther King was actually working for nationally okay. to have that uh, unity of races uh, nationally that we had on, on that one little uh, block there. And uh, that's so uh, encouraging to hear that not everyone during the civil rights movement, during the era, had uh, completely negative um, ex experiences, I should say, during that time. And so I think it's, it's quite, um, I think, uh, very relevant that we're having uh, this type of dialogue today because 
you know, one of the things I found is in speaking with individuals who have grown up through the movement, it's, there's almost this allegiance of we've got to continue to remember. We've got to, you just don't know how it was. And, and I can certainly um, have compassion for that. But then as we try to uh, talk about progression and, and working with a whole generation who knew nothing about um, separate water fountains mm -hmm. and having to sit at the back of the bus and all of these kinds of things, it really makes you wonder, are these kinds of dialogues counterproductive or productive? And I want to bring into the discussion right now uh, a young lady who is <laughs> knocking on the door of 90. So I know you have seen a lot in your many, many years. And you actually grew up with Dr. King as a little boy, even prior to mm -hmm. his starting to make such a, a noise in our country. Tell us about that. Donna, I will be happy to tell you about that, <laughs> Wayne, and all of you out there. I want to take you back to 1925. Mm -mm. Now, that's the 20th century, remember. Yes. In 1925, in Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta was a beautiful city, mm -hmm. and uh, we were very proud of Atlanta, except I have to tell you the truth about it. In the colored community, I was born colored. Mm. I've been colored, Negro, black, African American. <laughs> One day I just like to be an American. Amen but Dr. That. King was yes. born in the 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I'm a few years older than he is. I hate to admit it, but I am. <laughs> That's a blessing. But we were born there before 1930. And Atlanta at that time was segregated. It was the law of the land. Mm. And we had to follow certain rules and regulations being colored. Mm -hmm. We were born in the colored section of hospitals because you were not allowed in the white nursery, mm -hmm. a colored baby. We could not eat in white restaurants we had to, if we could eat anything from that restaurant, we had to go around to the back and it was handed to us in a brown paper bag. Mm. Most of them wow. wouldn't hand us anything. We had to just walk on by. Mm. We could not use the swimming pools. If we, we had a streetcar that ran up and down Auburn Avenue. On the streetcar, if you got on, if you were standing in line waiting to get on the streetcar, and white people came after you, they had to go to the front of the line and get on. You had to move back. Wow. When you got on the streetcar, then we had to sit behind the sign and it said, colored only. Mm -hmm. And if the white people decided they weren't going to move that sign up, I don't care how many colored people were standing up, you had to stand up. Mm. We could not sit down. There were so many laws that we had to obey because if we didn't obey them, we were immediately put in jail or maybe even beaten and put in jail. Wow. And so it was a very tough time. Mm -hmm. But during that, I want you to know that in, in segregation, the colored people saw a niche that they could fill. Mm -hmm. And on Auburn Avenue, the colored people started their own businesses. Mm -mm. And so we had <laughs> banks, doctors, lawyers, dentists, specialists. We had a daily a newspaper, mm -hmm. uh, Atlanta Daily World. We had uh, Atlanta Life Insurance Company, uh, founded by a person who looked like he was white. <laughs> but had one drop of Negro blood, colored blood mm -hmm. in him, and therefore he was colored to some and white to the others. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our homes, I have to tell you about the homes. In the homes of the kings and the yaps, all of us 
we were taught to love mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. in spite of whether they, what color they were or creed or what have you. We were taught the value of education. We were taught to hate the segregation acts, mm -hmm. but not the people. people. Mm -hmm. Right. And there is a difference. There's a huge we difference. were taught to yes. learn. Mm -hmm. And we in Atlanta at that time we had seven colored colleges and universities. Spelman College, founded by two white women in the basement of colored Friendship Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. Morehouse College, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, president, one of the greatest orators in America. Um, Morris Brown, Clark, Atlanta University, Yaman Theological Seminary, and so on. But we had our thrust in loving people. We would fight against segregation. The church was the center, the center of our lives. Mm. It was our religious life, our economic life, our political life, our social life. The church was where Dr. King went to meet girls, <laughs> where Irene went to meet boys. <laughs> that, that was our place. And the ministers had a powerful influence mm -hmm. on us. They used their pulpits mm -hmm. to bring us into uh, Jesus. And if I could mm -hmm. jump in there, then, mm -hmm. that is, I believe, what made Dr. King so integral during that time is his understanding of how uh, black people and people in general perhaps were raised with that connection to the church but he also had a way of making God's Word very relevant to the days and times uh, they were in he was in right then mr. Wayne yeah I wanted to add uh, the, how integral the ministers were the ministers worked for the people they were employed by the people of the church mm -hmm. uh, during those times, there were these uh, threats against people that took part in civil rights demonstrations about losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, the ministers' jobs, they worked for the people. And so the threats of them losing their jobs were, weren't there. So they were more free mm -hmm. to be able to, uh, to lead these demonstrations. And uh, that happened to quite a bit of people. I know one lady in particular, Ms. Septa McClark who was an advisor to uh, Martin Luther King and, and one of the influences for uh, Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. She was a teacher and she actually did lose her job, you know, for being a member of the NAACP. And so there was always this, uh, can I take part because my family may be, uh, you know, detrimentally affected if I take part in this march. Right. You know, versus uh, what the preachers could do. When could I tell you about an incident? It just brought it to my mind that happened. See, my mother's home was right next door to Wheat Street Baptist mm -hmm. Church, and Reverend William Holmes Bordis was the minister, and before that it was Reverend Henderson. And one block up the street was Ebenezer Baptist Church. But they were going to have a political rally that night. Mm -hmm. There was somebody coming to speak mm -hmm. to uh, the colored people, and we were told that if they allowed him to speak, that the church would be bombed. Right. My mother was fearless. She demanded that I go with her and mm -hmm. sit on the front porch in the swing, in the light of the church. Trust me, Donna, Wayne, audience, that was the longest meeting <laughs> I've ever sat through. And, but nobody bombed the church. And mm. finally we went in and went to bed when the lights went out at the church. But I was scared. Oh, yes. oh but yes. But my mother, uh, bless her heart, she stood tall. You know, I, and, and those stories really, there's so many thoughts that, that are in my mind right now from uh, what the point you all made about what we teach our children, that we don't come here with a heart of, of disdain and hatred, yeah. but those are learned behaviors by what we are teaching our children in our homes and also just although those were turbulent times, those were terrible times in some instances, the fearlessness, the boldness by which uh, the parents during those times either reinforced certain messages or uh, you know, dispelled certain themes, then that had 
a very crucial part in the mentality of our children. And I think with Dr. King, his ability to connect with parents, with working people, with the poor, with, um, uh, you know, those individuals, I think is what made him matter then because we connected with the Lord. We knew that the Lord would make a way, some kind of way, and that's what I heard my grandparents say, and, and, and that's what they held on to. So he was able to use God's word in a way to help bring hope. The, the courage came from the spirituality. Um, I would... I was, I was like a fly on the wall, I'd sit in the hallway and listen to these meetings and uh, people would voice their concerns. And uh, you know, uh, the, the gentleman that came from Atlanta with Abernathy and the group, they come down and say, uh, these things are going to happen. We've heard that they're going to be tear gas and things and people were fearful. But the spirituality that was uh, displayed is what gave people the courage. We're going to continue with that and much, much more. Uh, we, joining us will be news anchor right here from Channel 12, Richard Rogers. As we continue the dialogue, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., why his life mattered then and why it matters now. We'll be right back. Weekends are for resting, relaxing, and recharging your batteries. A good weekend can also give you the time to catch up on business you couldn't get to during the week. For Security Federal Bank customers, that means banking business. What does seven-day banking mean to your banker? More importantly, what does it mean to you? At Security Federal Bank, being open seven days a week means just that. That's why our Southside branch on Whiskey Road in front of Target is open for business every day, even Saturday and Sunday. We're proud to be the only bank to be open seven days a week in Aiken County. If we were you, we'd bank with us. Margaret's Garden Adult Daycare is coming soon to serve the community of Aiken. We are dedicated to enhancing the emotional, mental, and physical well-being of our clients, allowing seniors to remain in the community as long as possible. A daily fitness plan, games, weekly outings, fine dining, and discussion groups are just a few of the services we offer to keep your loved one active and engaged. Margaret's Garden. We meet you where you are. Why go to college anywhere else? For the past four years, U.S. News & World Report has named University of South Carolina Aiken the number one top public comprehensive college in the South. You can attend one of the best universities in the nation with more than 49 majors in academic programs, nationally ranked athletics, and great student life. With small classes, the faculty and staff are focused on your success. USC Aiken, the university focused on you. When it comes to grilling, I'm the man. Using Don Season in the Light, I'm the grill master. My seasoning is available at Prober, Bilo, Food Line, Reeds, and Harvest. Look for it on display in the meat department. Also visit SeasoningDelight.com for information and recipes. Don Seasoning Delight, it's so good. Don Seasoning Delight is so good. If you are interested in becoming an individual or corporate sponsor of Education Matters, contact Donna Moore Wesby at 803-507-6793 or email at DonnaWesby at AOL.com. President Johnson addresses a joint session of Congress to push a voting rights bill aimed at ending discrimination. It would appoint federal voting registrars in some instances and put an end to complicated literacy tests and other hampering tactics. The president referred to the events in Selma as an American tragedy. And throughout the nation, even in Canada, there were marches through the streets of towns and cities. In New York's Harlem, more than 15,000, half of them white, filed somberly through the streets in quiet but agonized protest. The events in Selma had been brought to a climax by a nighttime attack on a white Boston minister by white men. He died two days later. Many feeling he suffered martyrdom in the cause of civil rights and voting discrimination. The next day, four men were held for his murder. For the Reverend James J. Reeb, the demonstrators write his epitaph with this tribute.
Selma sprang overnight from an obscure southern town to the front pages of world newspapers. This church was headquarters in the Negro Drive for the right to vote. And it was here that Martin Luther King came to lend his support to the campaign. He pointed out that from Selma's 14,000 Negroes, only a few more than 300 had been registered at the polls. When one group set out to march to the Capitol at Montgomery, the procession was broken up violently by state troopers and sheriff's deputies. Then Dr. King led another contingent through the town. Wow, it's a very fascinating uh, clip there of what took mm -hmm. place in Selma. Hundred, uh, not hundreds of thousands, thousands of individuals. And I think what really stands out to me in this clip uh, that I believe oftentimes gets uh, left out or forgotten is that this movement, the civil rights movement, this era, this fight was not just about blacks. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. just about blacks and whites and, and, the, and whites against blacks. But if, if, if my facts are correct, over half of the individuals marching in Selma were not black. They were white. That's right. And, yes. um, and so that, the, that to me showed me that there was hope, that not everyone <laughs> <laughs> felt the way that it seemed was so uh, pervasive during those times. And, and joining us now uh, in, in this dialogue is someone you definitely uh, know, and that is Richard Rogers, who is an anchor, the news anchor, yeah here mm -hmm. on Channel 12. And I understand you uh, had some, you were actually a little older than uh, Mr. O'Brien here. Right, Wayne, Wayne is, <laughs> Wayne's story is my story too. Okay. I was a few years yeah. removed okay. and I appreciate you saying mm -hmm. that. He was in Charleston, I was just a few hundred miles down the coast in Brunswick, oh. another small coastal town. But thank you for letting me be part of this. I've enjoyed yes. his stories here this morning and uh, it's just been interesting to hear that perspective. Yes. I saw it from a little different angle coming in. Uh, to elementary school. I, I met my first black friends and had my first black teachers because of Dr. King and that happened to me in my elementary school years but mm -hmm. I'm glad you said those lifelong friends for you are like brothers and that's, yeah. the, that's the case in my case too. When you are, are living in, were living in those days and times and you saw uh, the, the hatred, the, 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 just the passion there actually on both sides, as a child if, if you can recall how do you then decide, you know, how you are going to display yourself as an individual when you see people who look like you behaving in a certain way, but in your heart, you may have known something or felt something different? I remember it being a, a scary time in, in my town, mm -hmm. in my elementary school. I remember being frightened when Dr. King was killed because we wondered what would right. happen next. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what's the reaction going to be? But um, when you boil it down to kids in elementary school, it was about friendships for us. And mm -hmm. I met my first black friend there, and uh, we're still, we were talking on Facebook this week. I asked him permission <laughs> to tell his story here uh -huh. with you this morning. But um, for us, uh, we were both musicians in the elementary school band, fifth grade. Wow. He, Lemuel played <laughs> saxophone, I played drums. And he still plays saxophone today, I still play mm -hmm. drums today. Awesome. And I brought a picture I want you to see. I've, this has never been shown on television, oh, but wow. there's a <laughs> shot of us. Not in elementary school, but in junior high school. Uh -huh. We were all playing together in a band mm -hmm. on stage. Mm -hmm. And I think that just said something, to have a mixed race band yes. in those days in where those people days. looked at us and said, if they can do it, we can do it. That's we right. were just friends. That's we, right. Was, there was no black and white division. We were just buddies. And we fortunately, thank God, we grew up in junior high school and high school the same way. And in my town, uh, there was no trouble. And mm. I think the news... Uh, we do. Yes. We seem to go to those flashpoints, right. Selma and other places where there are flashpoints because as journalists that's our job. Mm -hmm. But it gives the perception that every town right. was that way. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure about Charleston, but Brunswick never saw that kind of violence. Mm. And so I feel grateful that I, I didn't grow up in a town and in a family that had those racial roots. Right, so, right. Um, we can what thank a blessing. God for that. And uh, we have something in common in that we have children that are currently in college and um, th I believe that the Lord put your your face to uh, to my mind on, and being on this broadcast is we had that connection and I, and I know you also Mr. Wayne you have a, a mm -hmm. child that's in college 
as, as my ch children were growing up, they had French friends, uh, uh, Hispanic friends, Asian friends, you know, all of this division they just didn't grow up in. So when we talk about the events of the past, they just do not know, there's just no relating there. And for them, it's why do you keep putting things in black and white? <laughs> How do we move past what has happened in, the, in our history, which is very, very important. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here. I know that. I wouldn't have been able to enter uh, the, some of the colleges and, and other educational opportunities I have had if it were not for the sacrifices of Dr. King and many individuals before him and after him. Wow. So how do we bridge the gap and move forward? I can tell you what I do working with young people. Uh, what I do is I, I talk about McDonald's because everybody knows what that is. Okay. And when I talk about there was a time when you could have five dollars in your pocket and your friend could have five dollars in your pocket but because you look differently, he could walk into the front door and get a Happy Meal mm -hmm. and they tell you, you have to go around the back and get a brown paper bag. Okay. And he gets a toy and you don't and you're saying, well, I have the same five dollars. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you, and they'll say, well, why couldn't I do that? And it was just because you look differently. Mm. And so when you put things into perspective and you say that if it wasn't for what Dr. King did, you wouldn't be able to do something as simple as that. And so, uh, you know, I use that, and I, you know, I always use very common things. Mm -hmm. um, when President Obama was running for president for the first time, uh, because my children went to North Augusta High, and which is, you know, integrated. Mm -hmm. And so they grew up with each other. You know, they're friends, they go to each other's birthday parties. Speaking of which, I'm going to show a couple of photos <laughs> okay. now as mm -hmm. you're talking of young people, black and white, right. who don't care anything about <laughs> what's on the outside. It's and, what's on the inside. And it's because of, and I know with, with you, it's, sometimes it's because of the parents. Mm -hmm. The parents raise you a certain way, Most even in those time. environments. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, when he was running for president, I was kind of in the general area listening to these these young people, this was his first year, he was going to vote, he was 18, mm -hmm. and they were speaking, there were people of all different races and backgrounds, and they were saying, hey, I like kind of how this guy is, well, I'm going to listen to him, mm -hmm. because I'm thinking about voting for him. And me growing up in the era, even though we saw that this was a different type of a candidate, uh, there was still this, will we ever see this in our lifetime? Yes. But these young people, my son and his friends, they were saying, oh, he, I don't see any reason why he can't win. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and <laughs> why the attitudes were so different is because for the last 40 years, they had spent time with each other. Yes. They were in the same classrooms, learning the same things, spent time, and this is the whole generation that the attitudes changed, and some of the older people, we just didn't see it changing as much as it did, yes. but they really just didn't see, well, I'm voting for it. Wayne and I, I will always remember our first black friend or our first white friend, mm -hmm. but that, to your question, our, our kids won't. No. Because right. they've been surrounded right. by so mm -hmm. many. That's an excellent that's point. That's changed right there. Yes, yes. I have lived to see so many things yes. happen in my lifetime that I never dreamed I would be able to see. Right. When my son was living, uh, he's an architect, and he was living in Atlanta designing airports, I, would, I went to visit him, my husband and I, and where did I, he said, Mother, where would you like to go? And I said, first place I want to go is the Fox Theater in the front <laughs> door. Right. Because a long yeah, time ago, when I was a little girl, we had to go around yeah. the side and go up the yes. steps in the mm -hmm. rain. And Something cold. that now people just take yeah, for granted. I didn't realize how granted. beautiful it was mm -hmm. downstairs, yes. the wood, the carpeting, mm -hmm. the chandeliers. Mm -hmm. I never had a chance mm -hmm. to see that. I want to uh, show you this is a flag. Um, it's actually a quilt, <coughs> handmade by a quilter, local quilter named Jackie Hill. And she is phenomenal. She is absolutely phenomenal. But one of the stitches, and I'm not sure if we can get a close-up, and, and I want you all to respond uh, on this quilt, says, learning from history helps us to let go of the past in a loving way. With understanding, we seek a future good for all. Are we saying we need to let go of the past? Or, Miss Irene, is there a way where we can connect the past with our future? 
we can connect the past with our future because we can look at the home that Dr. King grew up in. His mother and the wife of Reverend Borders, there were many of the black men, I'm sorry, we were colored then, colored <laughs> ministers' wives who met in the homes with white people mm -hmm. who were sympathetic to our cause and who felt that we were being treated like second-class citizens, and we were, mm -hmm. and they would talk with them and bond with them on ways that they could work in order to improve race relations. Mm -hmm. So Dr. King came up in an atmosphere of love and of negotiating in a way where you didn't use the gun, where you used your head mm -hmm. to think and to talk <laughs> to people, that connection where uh, we didn't have all the electrical things we have today, the new technologies, so it was the art of conversation. Yes. And if you ever heard him speak, <laughs> you know that he's the one person that made one of the greatest speeches that was ever said during the 20th mm -hmm. century, mm -hmm. and it still lives. And it still lives. Well, if I could, uh, you actually have to hold on to the past. Mm. You know, it's about transitioning, but uh, if you ever forget the past, for instance, uh, our country, we know about Declaration of Independence and that's the past. Yes. But you have to bring those things into the present. Mm -hmm. And even with when you uh, people get into their religions, all those things actually happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But we don't let them go and forget about those. Right. It's a continuation and it's a growth that goes on. A continuation and a growth. I think those are excellent words to uh, move us forward. Uh, when I think about my life and the fact that um, I was able to grow up in a home that was loving and caring, a home that uh, enforced the importance of education, reinforced the importance and enforced by my mama, <laughs> <laughs> the importance of education, but also the necessity of love and working together and coming together in unity. and when I, my heart actually breaks sometimes to look at the pictures of the past and to just, rem, just to reflect on what could be going through someone's mind who, is a, who was a, a, enduring uh, those um, segregated times, but also the heart of the individuals inflicting such pain and hurt and wonder what their lives were like. Because to me, it goes against human nature to display such acts of hatred and, and division. So was it, Mr. Rogers, in your assessment, especially in covering stories over the years and your uh, journalistic responsibility for the truth, do you believe uh, all of this was root, is rooted but back then in ignorance, or was it just a lack of courage? Maybe it's a little of both. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard to watch that and, and believe that this is our country, and I think that's the value mm -hmm. of going back and seeing some of these film clips as we celebrate mm -hmm. Dr. King's uh, day coming up on tomorrow. Um, it's just to be reminded and to see that and to be reminded of, yeah, that was our country. We came yeah. through that. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, we, sent, we tend, tend to have a short attention span sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if we're not reminded, we do tend to yeah. forget about things. Mm -hmm. yes. So there is a value in that. And I, I just feel sorry for those people who are on the wrong side of this story mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. eventually, did they, did they open their eyes? Did they come to yeah. the truth? Yeah. Did they go to their grave with hatred in their heart? Mm -hmm. Or did they come to realize these people are just my neighbors, just That's my right. friends? So, you hope so, and the thing that hurts the most, I think, is to go back and, and see that the, the, the families who still today, maybe on both sides, who still foster the relationship, um, I don't know, turmoil. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the, the ones where word. peace is not yes. uh, at home. Yes. And that's where I, the, your heart really breaks for those people because we have come such a long way, right. and yet I guess there are people who are still trying to catch up. Yeah, and, and, and uh, speaking of coming a long way, I believe obviously with the fact that we're here right. together mm -hmm. having uh, a, such um, an intelligent conversation <coughs> and understanding, but when you look at current events, happening in our country, it makes you wonder exactly how far have we come or, are, uh, or is the attitude uh, 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 hidden 
you know, not, not as out in the front, you know, and I must bring up, especially with you having uh, three sons, right. uh, the events in our country where uh, there is, uh, you know, individuals who are being killed by law enforcement, those who are there to protect and serve, and of course, uh, you know, all of that going on, looming in our country, and, and those thinking that it's rooted in racism. Are we taking steps backward when we look at these kinds of events that are still taking place in our country? You touched on this earlier, uh, if you don't know your past, because history tends to repeat itself, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can avoid those things if you know your past. Uh, I, I see this differently. I recall you talking about the people that grew up and went through some of these behaviors. Um, whenever change is coming, hmm. people are resistant to change because they've been used to that particular way of life, and mm -hmm. that's the way it was in the in the sixties. So been you see used, it as a necessary yeah. evil, and in so somewhat. yeah, sometimes it's it's a difficult thing. Now we're going to weather this, mm -hmm. and we'll come out better for it. But whenever there's a change, there's a resistance to change, mm -hmm. and it brings these things up, these conflicts, right? President Obama yes. being elected was something that was different. And then you know, all of a sudden now I have to get used to this and it was a change. And so you're seeing a little bit of uh, turmoil and things going on, but we'll weather it. And when we come out of the other end, we'll be a little further along. But then there's going to be something in the future down the line mm -hmm. that's going <laughs> to represent another big change and there's going to be a little bit of uh, resistance to it. But as long as the country continues to you take one step back and two steps forward hmm. instead of two steps back and one step forward. And that's what we do from time to time. We'll take a few steps forward, we'll take a step back, we'll get back on track, and then we'll start moving forward again. Yeah, so right. the, you know, the progress is positive. And, uh, you know, like I said, we'll weather this. We'll weather this. Mm -hmm. Well, and that gives us hope. <laughs> and sometimes when you wake up and you turn on the news and turn on News 12, Please and, amen. You, <laughs> amen. On and, you, that's right. and you hear of another shooting, or you hear of war, and, and my son, he, he, told, he told us this, he told us this several years ago, he felt like there was going to be civil war, um, individuals, you know, still fighting, and, and some of it rooted in um, their spiritual beliefs, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and some of those wars, that'll never end, because it's generational it goes from one generation to the next but it, it says that um, you know there's hope and we just have to stay the course and there is a keep on going I have a, a thing I live by and but it's rooted in all the spiritual truths mm -hmm. and it's do the right thing for the right reasons mm. and it's basically a um, <coughs> do one to other type of thing but do the right thing for the right reasons mm -hmm. and when I watch because I've studied all the religions you know, just so I can understand where other people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mindsets are. But when you look at those bombings, terrorist type bombings, even if you believe that's the right reason, you did the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And see, uh, what Martin Luther King wanted to do is he did believe some of the laws were wrong. So how do we try to get those things changed in the right way? Right. And so he used the Constitution. We have the right to peacefully assemble yes. and things like that. So he peacefully protested because he was within the law to change the law. And then those, mm -hmm. as you said, although it was uncomfortable, change ended up taking right. place as we in this country have celebrated uh, the 50 years of the uh, Voting Rights Act and the, the Civil Rights Act. So things can happen and things right. will happen. As we are about to close, I want to come back to you, Miss Irene. You grew up. Uh, around Dr. King as a little boy, and I remember you saying to me, <laughs> there was nothing so extraordinary about him then, but obviously God used him to do some extraordinary things. In your assessment, why do you believe we should continue to pay homage to Dr. King and why his life mattered? His life matters because <clears throat> as a little boy growing up colored, I played with him. However, he was smart. I never dreamed that this little boy <laughs> that we played with, that we teased, would one day grow up <laughs> to change the course of history mm -hmm. in Atlanta, in Georgia, 
in our country and the world. Mm -hmm. yes. If anybody had told me that, <laughs> I would have said, you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> but it taught me that we should never put a ceiling right, on right. the head of any child. That's right. We Black, should push white, them Asian, forward, educate them matter. as much as we can, yes. do everything for them we can to, so that when they are tapped on the shoulder by God for whatever they're supposed mm -hmm. to do in America, they will do it. They will do There's it. There's hope for us all. That's right. Yeah. There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> Even the little ones. Yes. Even the little ones. Just yes. a quick story. A few years ago, there was a celebration of Dr. King at one of the churches in downtown Augusta. I think it was Curtis. And I was the master of ceremonies mm -hmm. that morning, just kind of running the show. And as I sat there and looked out over the crowd, I thought, heaven's going to look a little bit like this. Right. <laughs> and there is not room for racism <laughs> when you're all together in a church. Unfortunately, it's still one of the most segregated hours in America, yes. but that too is changing. That right. too is changing, and the change can start right here today in your homes, in your churches, in your schools. Closing us out today will be Dr. King himself with one of my personal favorites. Thanks so much for watching. The crisis in race relations can be attributed to the fact but there are still too many of our white brothers who are concerned about the length of life rather than the breadth of life, concerned about their economic, or their preferred economic positions, their political power and dynasties, their social status, their so-called way of life, and if only they would substitute or rather add breath to length, if only they would add the other regarding dimension to the self-regarding dimension, we would be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. One day all men and women of this nation must come to see that God made all of us to live together as brothers, that somehow every man must respect the dignity and worth of human personality, and ultimately a man must be judged not on the basis of the color of his skin, but the content of his character. Somewhere we must discover the world over that we must learn to live together as brothers, or we will all perish together as fools.